Hey everybody, welcome back. Another video for you. Been a couple of days since I was able to record. Uh, as you know, if you have any, if you have kids, you know that uh, everything comes to a grinding halt when your kids get sick. So um, anyway, here we are. It is the evening of March 15th. I am recording at 8.15 in the evening. Um, so much to talk about. I will just say that anything that I'm not able to get to in my limited time here, you can go over to the Patreon page and uh, for that small subscription fee, you'll have access to a bunch more videos. I'm probably going to try to record at least one or two more here tonight. Uh, anyway, go over to the Patreon. Really appreciate those of you who have supported me thus far. Let's talk about some economic issues related to Russia. So much to discuss just in that area. I want to talk about Russia's GDP and what we expect for Russia's GDP, because of course we know that while gross domestic product isn't the only economic factor that matters, it is still extremely relevant and a very good indicator of what uh, at least experts in the financial industry uh, are expecting for Russia in the coming quarters. So um, this is at least one expert's prediction. And uh, I will just note, I am referring to predictions from Robert Brooks, Chief, uh, excuse me, Robin Brooks, chief economist at the Institute for International Finance. Now, here's somebody who is an insider's insider, Goldman Sachs and Wall Street and all of the rest. So when uh, Institute for International Finance speaks, I think we know what what voice it is speaking. And that sector of finance capital is not particularly positive about the prospects for Russia. Um, according to his estimates, GDP to fall by the end of 2022 in Russia, GDP fall of 30%. Okay, that is an extraordinary figure. You're talking economic collapse of almost unprecedented speed and scale. Um, so for the, the financial conditions inside of the country, they are tightening because the sanctions are tightening. And when we say financial conditions, we really are talking about uh, the financial mood inside of the country, the mood, the ability to do business, the ability to gain uh, uh, financing and credit, the ability to uh, stimulate demand. If people don't have uh, the means with which to purchase the products, it doesn't matter if the products are there or not. So um, this, as I, as I just sort of was alluding to, the choking of domestic demand is going to be a very, very significant problem here because as that collapses, so too does everything else with the domestic market. Um, we are talking about a, a likely scenario where the Russian uh, bank, the Russian central bank is going to have to, well, print more money to keep up with the with with you know the conditions and as it prints more money you end up in that really disastrous inflationary spiral i guess it would be sort of like a hyper inflationary uh stagflation stagnation or i guess you'd have a simultaneous hyper inflation and collapse of uh domestic demand i don't know what exactly you would call that um but in any event this is a huge huge disaster for Russia. I don't need to explain any further what the loss of one third of a country's GDP is, but I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of Russians who are living already paycheck to paycheck, kind of sort of on the brink of, uh, you know, poverty and so forth. This will certainly push them over the edge. Many people who have been living more or less working class uh, existence will now be living at the sort of edge of survival. I think we, we should probably keep in mind a couple of reference points to understand Russia's economy here. 2009 was disastrous for Russia coming out of the uh, global economic crisis that begins in you know, late 2007 and into 2008, and then especially by September of 2008. By 2009, that contagion had really spread all over the world. Russia was one of the countries hit extremely hard by, um, by those conditions. And what we're facing now is orders of magnitude worse. Now, I would just tie this back to the early 1990s for Russia because, um, Coming out of the uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russian economy, and I mean, this is an old story that I'm, you know, sort of recapping for many, I'm sure, but coming out of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Russian economy is more or less uh, stripped for parts, picked clean by the vultures of Wall Street and uh, of Europe who come to Russia more or less to allow a very, very small 
class of Russians to become what we now know as oligarchs, enriching themselves off of the sort of fire sale of the Soviet uh, you know, state economy. And the selling off of those resources, the you know, stripping for parts, as it were, um, this is all part and parcel of the darkest period of Russia's post-Soviet existence, those first few years and the deepest and darkest of economic depression in 1993 and into 1994. And I happen to know a little bit about it because I lived in Russia at the time. I was 10 years old and I did experience it, at least from the perspective of a very privileged Westerner who happened to be living there uh, at the time. And I remember vividly thousands of rubles to a dollar. I remember poverty in the streets. I remember all kinds of really uh, awful scenes that for somebody like me who grew up in, you know, suburban Southern California, it was jarring to say the least and that was really only for about a 10 month window in 1993 and 1994 but the reason i bring it up uh and it's not to draw on my experience which as i said was that of a child but it is to say that people who are over the age of 40 do have in their own living memory an understanding of how dark and how deep the the economic uh, abyss can go. And this is particularly relevant now because we have to then think about the sort of myth of Putin. Maybe it's not a myth. Maybe it's some some elements of truth, but sort of the mythos around Putin, basically, that what Putin's legitimacy rests on is not necessarily electoral mandates. It's not necessarily, you know, his shirtless photos or his virile manhood or popularity or anything. It really rests on a very simple and yet powerful premise that Putin restored order after the chaotic disaster of the 1990s. And that Putin's legitimacy is really rooted in this idea. And here we are, 2022, 30 years later, 22 years after Putin ascends to power, and Russia finds itself in a mess very similar economically to those deep, dark, early 90s days. And then it raises the question of whether Putin's legitimacy extends into this period. Does Putin's legitimacy, which to a large extent is built on that, you know, image of somebody who rescued Russia and remade it, you know, made it great again, as it were, um, does that survive this kind of an economic calamity? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it does or doesn't. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of factors that play into it, but I don't think we should underestimate the fact that. As I said, much of Putin's popularity is sort of rooted in the idea that he is stability and that he was the one who really turned the page from that awful and humiliating chapter of the 1990s. And 30 years later, it looks like Russia's right back in the same spot, thanks to Putin. Or at least that's how it might appear to some. We shall see. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about the mood in Russia because this then sets the stage for uh, uh, another issue that needs to be discussed. If you're a Counterpunch Plus subscriber, you may have seen my article from last week, The Kremlin Goes Neocon. Uh, to summarize it very quickly, my, my basic argument is that Putin has more or less copied almost verbatim most of the uh, plan that was uh, you know, uh, executed by the neocons, by Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, et cetera, vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. He has basically imported that onto Ukraine, everything from the completely bogus justifications about uh, you know, mushroom clouds and smoking guns in 2003, and Putin's justifications about the, you know, the potential of Ukraine developing a nuclear uh, weapon and aiming it at Russia. I mean, it was all so similar, the creation of reality the manufacturing of facts on the ground, overwhelming force, shock and awe, all of these different uh, uh, elements of the neocon strategy that Bush, and, uh, excuse me, that Putin sort of stole from Bush, or maybe we should say internalized from Bush. Now, all of that is to say that it sets the stage for the question of, when, of how and or when Putin gets his 
mission accomplished moment. We all remember that, that, you know, that war criminal Bush, you know, and the helicopter landing on the aircraft carrier, the big absurd mission accomplished uh, banner behind him and just the absolute farce of it all. Uh, Of course we remember that it's one of the, one of the great, um, you know, uh, humiliations on top of the war crimes and crimes against humanity and everything else that Bush was perpetrating. But why do I bring it up? Because you know that Putin is going to look for his mission accomplished moment. And I don't know what exactly that's going to look like, but it does seem that they might already be setting it up. It's very clear that Putin uh, sees the progress in Ukraine as taking uh, maybe longer than was expected and is certainly aware of the, uh, you know, really disastrous parallel in comparison to the Soviet uh, quagmire in Afghanistan. So, on Russian television, this is on uh, the program hosted by the very well-known, very popular Kremlin propagandist named Solovyov. Uh, he had two very, very pro-Putin guests on the program, and both of the guests were very stridently uh, arguing to end the war. Now think about this. Pro-Putin guests on a pro-Putin program arguing to end the war. It must be said that this this program and, and really this channel, this is very much sort of coordinated. This is not something that would have just happened by chance, like they're just shooting from the hip and no one has, uh, you know, prepared anything. This is a pre-recorded program that obviously was okayed from very high levels. I'm not saying Putin signs off on it necessarily, but who knows, including some of those oligarchs who are not so happy that their wealth has been destroyed, that everything that they have you know, stolen from the Russian people and, and, and parked in offshore accounts is all in jeopardy, right? So now here we have on Russian state TV, uh, two hardcore pro-Putin guests, both of them saying it's time to end the war. One of them arguing the sanctions are a disaster, that the military, uh, you know, in, that the invasion itself and the military progress has been a failure. And the fact of the matter being that Russia has absolutely no business continuing the war in Ukraine, most specifically saying that the Ukrainian military has proven itself to be not some, you know, paper tiger that could just be run through, but actually a pretty well battle hardened force that has, you know, been sort of forged over an eight year simmering war in Donbass, a military force that is not intimidated by the Russians. Um, and a military force that is obviously having some kind of covert support. So the question really, again, comes to what exactly is Russia supposed to keep doing there? I will just say the two hardcore Putin, you know, sort of pro-Putin propagandists. The first one, his name, Shak Nazarov. Shak Nazarov saying uh, this about, you know, Ukraine's military, basically saying there is no chance no chance of a pro-Moscow government being installed in Ukraine, number one, because it doesn't seem that Russia has the upper hand in that way. And probably more to the point, there ain't nobody in Ukraine that's stupid enough to take that kind of a position, knowing that they'll probably not live to see, you know, the following month. So clearly there are elements within the Russian state that are beginning to argue for ending this and ending this soon. Uh, Sheikh Nazarov also talked about the real danger of protests inside the country, of the continued isolation of Russia, etc. Now, the other guest is a guy named Bagdazarov, and Bagdazarov uh, was also talking about sanctions from the other side, talking about that if Russia doesn't end the war and end the sanctions quickly, those sanctions on Iran are going to be undone. Iran will fill the Russian gap with its oil and gas and so forth, that Iran and Kazakhstan and some of these other countries will have no problem selling energy to the West and undercutting Russia and forcing Russia into this extremely isolated, economically isolated position. Again, I just want to stress This was a conversation between pro-Putin voices on a pro-Putin program on a pro-Putin network. Okay, so I think that we need to sort of read between the lines here and understand it at the very least, just even if we want to be generous to Putin in our interpretation of this, we could say at the very least that clearly segments of the ruling class in Russia 
are very unhappy and are willing to air, air those grievances publicly. Now, are they grievances against Putin or is this sort of priming the pump, as it were, priming public opinion, preparing it for a mission accomplished. Yes, we denazified. Yes, we degraded their military. Yes, they'll never be able to develop a nuclear weapon and harm us. Yes, they're not going to be into NATO, whatever it might be. If the Russians can get these kinds of concessions and can turn around, and Putin specifically, turn around and say to his own population see mission accomplished you know probably with a you know fighter jet uniform or maybe he'll be riding on a horse without a shirt or whatever shit he'll do you know uh he's gonna he's looking for that moment and i think we might be seeing the first indications that there's something bubbling up in uh russian popular media hinting in that direction. Okay, last couple of minutes, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the massive cyber attack that hit Israel yesterday. Um, you know, again, I'm cautious when I talk about issues like this, because there's simply no way to know exactly what's going on. None of us None of us are, you know, Mossad or FSB or CIA or any of these intelligence agencies. So we don't have any inside information. We can simply guess at what might be going on here. And I would like to just point out a couple of things. First, I don't have a hard and fast theory on exactly what happened here. I have probably four potential options for what could potential what possibly was happening and I'd be willing to entertain others if other people have them you can even throw them into the YouTube comments if you'd like um, the first is the timing of this Israel is hit by a cyber attack 24 hour I think 24 hours or maybe even less after it announces that it finally will go along with sanctions against Russia oh dear theory number one Russia is retaliating against Israel for going along with U.S. sanctions on Russia, and they have attacked Israeli cyber infrastructure. So, the so theory number one: Russia is punishing Israel for siding with the United States. Okay, it's possible. I'm not. I'm not convinced. I think that's very simplistic and maybe not even totally accurate, but it's possible. Uh, theory number two. Russia all, also involves Russia having carried out this attack, but it involves the Iran negotiations. The Iran nuclear negotiations are deeply worrisome for Russia, as I just said in the prior, you know, with the prior story about sanctions and about Iranian oil. The minute those sanctions are lifted and Iran can normalize in terms of the global energy markets, Iran becomes again a, a major player in terms of oil and gas exports. Where does that leave Russia? You know, those oil companies in Europe have been just, you know, sort of salivating over Iran for decades. Total and, you know, the Italians, any and uh, uh, Stott Oil of Norway, <laughs> I mean, you know, um, BP, of course, all of these European oil uh, majors that, that want a piece of Iran. And some of those have just walked away from very lucrative lucrative uh, deals with Russia. So the, the idea that the sort of nuclear talks leading to normalization leads to a further isolation of Russia could potentially explain why Russia would carry out an attack on Israel in order to blame it on the Iranians and potentially scuttle the deal. Maybe. I, again, it's a possibility. I'm not saying that's what happened, but it's possible. The third possibility was Iran exploiting a window of opportunity here as they saw Israel caught between two very close allies in uh, the United States for obvious reasons and Putin's Russia, which is very, very close to Israel for all sorts of reasons, including their very nefarious uh, collaborations in Syria, including all kinds of really nasty deals uh, that, that well, we don't have time to go into, but let's just say that Netanyahu and Putin were close 
Putin and Netanyahu have in many and in many instances found themselves on the same page. And just because it's Bennett and not Netanyahu, that dynamic doesn't necessarily change, especially when you consider how predominant the Russian language is in Israel, how many uh, Israeli citizens either come directly from Russia or have their direct uh, ancestry from Russia. So there is a there is a cultural, social, political, economic sort of closeness there. So what is the um, uh, Iranian position? Well, the Iranians just fired some rockets at a U.S. base. Did the Iranians also take a window of opportunity to strike back at the Israelis for, well, any number of cyber attacks that they have carried out from the Stuxnet and the flame and the Gauss viruses to the assassinations and all the other things that the Israelis have carried out against the Iranians? Also possible. Hey, guess what, conspiracy fans? Israeli false flag is also possible, too. Did the Israelis potentially, uh, you know, uh, manufacture something to take down some of their own websites in order to potentially blame the Iranians and scuttle those nuclear talks? It's also possible, considering Israel's history, considering uh, just how dangerous they find uh, Iran and, uh, you know, the United States' negotiations. Again, this has its roots going back to the Obama years. Biden uh, is surrounded by Obama's people. Obama's people saw Trump reneging on the nuclear deal with Iran as one of the great uh, sort of uh, humiliations that Trump perpetrated against Obama and Obama's legacy. It is a key feature of what they want to do to get this deal done. So there are a lot of possibilities for who might have carried something like this out. And uh, again, it's not entirely clear, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily venture a guess, but I will say that we know of the capabilities, the cyber war capabilities of the United States, of the Israelis themselves, of the Russians, of the Iranians, and of a number of other parties. So I guess more information is going to have to come out, but it is fun to ponder, isn't it? Um, and let me just say very quickly, actually, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but as we talk about who's benefiting and who's losing from this ghastly, ghastly war, uh, it should be noted that, uh, let's see, reported as of yesterday in a variety of newspapers and media outlets, headline, actually, this was in Forbes, War stocks are surging as Russia-Ukraine conflict rages on. Lockheed Martin Northrop up 20%. So isn't that wonderful that in the end, Russia is getting economically hammered. The country is further isolated. The economy is collapsing. The currency is, is inflating. People are struggling. China is worried. Uh, uh, the global food supply is shrinking. And the weapons manufacturers are making a killing. War is a racket, ain't it? Gonna leave it there. Go over to the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. Lots more to talk about there. Let's see. I'm gonna give a I give a quick preview. I want to talk about Russian aviation. Uh, very interesting what happened with Bermuda of all countries. Uh, assassinations of Russian generals. I think we have three Russian generals killed in the last week and a half. That's interesting. Uh, Putin's volunteers from the Middle East headed to Ukraine. How about facial recognition being used in Ukraine? Boy, that's a tool of genocide. Lots more to talk about. Go over to the Patreon. Talk to you again next time.